Hello and welcome back. Um, if you remember in the last chapter, chapter six, uh, Jason and Sandy had gone to the welcoming uh, party and had had some amazing drinks and some amazing food. And um, in the process, they both had managed to drink uh, something out of a cobalt blue uh, bottle served by a genie and um, and then everything was going very well and then they collapsed and got rushed back to the room so that had ended chapter six so we are getting ready to start chapter seven which is the cobalt slug um, if you wait afterwards uh, we have a little bit of show and tell um, with uh, matrixes and all that good stuff but anyway um, all right Chapter 7, Cobalt Slug. I was shaking. Why was I shaking? I was in bed. Tyler was wrapped around me, holding me tight. Bermuda was snuggled up in my face, licking me. That felt soothing. My magic sight kicked in and I realized it wasn't Tyler, it was Balaji. Why was he in bed with me? My head felt like it was stuffed full of cotton. It was hard to think. You've been poisoned, my analytical side spoke up, and Balaji is here to make sure you don't do something awful, like swallow your tongue and choke to death, or throw up again while laying on your back and choke to death, or shake so much you get tangled up in the sheets and choke to death. I'm sensing a theme to his concerns, I said. Well, there have been a lot of discussion about that topic, he replied, and we've had a whole range of people in here trying to help, but as you know, healing charms just don't work with you. Finally, it was decided that Balaji would stay here with you and see if you could overcome it on your own. They are very concerned, and frankly, so am I. Well, gee, thanks for the report, for the support. I said sarcastically. Oh, dear chap, no. My analytical side waved his hands in the air. I usually have every faith in our abilities, but this is different from what we faced before. For starters, it's a two-pronged attack, physical and magical. T is all over the physical side, but I haven't been able to do anything on the magical side until you woke up a bit more. He sounded urgent, but I was still feeling very woozy. I needed to a moment to gather myself before I started doing anything. So how did I get poisoned, I asked. It was that stupid Jafar looking wanker, my analytical side said. Technically you weren't poisoned, you were given a very expensive and powerful drink. Do what? I was confused. Think of it this way, he continued. If someone gave you a shot of old Scottish whiskey, you'd savor the experience and send them a thank you note. On the other hand, if someone gave a baby that same shot of whiskey, it would seriously mess their system. It might even kill them. That's what happened to you. Mr. Suspicious got you to drink something that was designed for old, powerful mages. Their magic-enhanced bodies recover a lot faster, so it takes a powerful beverage to give them a buzz. Why did this happen? I was frustrated. I thought the house would protect me. For that matter, I thought that people who were part of the house were the good guys. It's a loophole, he shrugged. Did you mention to Jafar that you were a spark? I don't think so, I replied. Trust me, you didn't. My analytical side continued in his lecturing tone. You were at an event where most mages are higher level, and he suggested you drink a higher level drink. You agreed and drank it with your own hand, giving him no indication you couldn't handle it. So he has every right to claim this was an accident. Even though we know damn well it wasn't, he gave me a furious look. They got to Sandy too. From what I gather, they are working hard to stabilize her as well. Okay, so I drank some right gut moonshine, and now I've got the hangover blues, I said. So how do I fix this? I felt frustrated and upset. This was supposed to be a safe place. Safe place. This was supposed to be a time of wonder and adventure, and now some assholes had ruined it. Grrr. You've done step one, which is to throw up as much as you can. That got all the liquid that had been absorbed, that hadn't been absorbed yet, out of your stomach. Right now, you have physical poison in your system that T is working on, and you have some very dense hostile magic inside of you that's wrecking havoc with your matrix. It isn't moving fast, but it's already done a lot of damage, so you need to come up with a solution fairly quickly. 
Normally my analytical side hang, hammed up his British accent and threw in a couple choice bits of Cockney slang. He seemed to be really worried though because that was missing now. He was all business, so I needed to shape up promptly. T, I called. Here, he called back. I zoomed in so I could see him better. What's the status? The drink had more than just alcohol in it. It was laced with something else to give it more kick. Normally, I'd just flood your, your system with healing spores, and you'd be good as new in a few days. Right now, though, you need to be as clear-headed as possible to take care of the magic side, so I'm being very targeted with my spore usage. In addition to that, I'm working on trying to burn out some of the effects. He said that in a very self-satisfied way, like it was a brilliant solution. I saw myself just flaming out and going up in smoke. Um, sorry, I said, I am not following you. Imagine you took 10 shots of vodka and then threw up, he said. That would help clear your stomach, but you would still have a lot of alcohol in your blood. One way to clear that up is to work your muscles and burn up all that bad energy. I thought if you went for a five mile run, you'd feel a lot better after you finished. Obviously, you can't go for a run right now, so instead, I'm causing you to shiver like you're wrapped up with Jack Frost. It's a static form of exercise, but it's still burning off the poison. That was a very creative idea. Thank goodness I'd made tea, his grove, and my gem cell gauntlets to power them all. They were keeping me alive right now. Thank you, I said sincerely. It sounds like you have this under control, and I'll leave you to it. He bowed slightly and then hurried away. He had things to do and so did I. I scanned my aura for hostile magic and found it right away. There was a dark chunk of magic in my middle and it was tearing my matrix apart. The magic was a deep blue, deep cobalt blue, oblong shaped and very dense. It kept its shape and stuck together almost like honey floating through water. It seemed to bunch up quickly and then stretch out, like it was a worm or a slug. I could see little flashes all around it too, like little sparks of static electricity. I zoomed in for a closer look. The glob of magic wasn't just breaking my matrix apart, it was also splitting apart the emerald green and sapphire blue spheres that were its basic building blocks. It was putting enough pressure on the spheres to break them down into their individual capsules. Then I saw what was causing the flashing, the flashes, and I pulled back in horror. The damn thing was taking my sapphire magic, converting it to cobalt blue, and assimilating it. I had the damn Borg inside me. It was eating my magic. For a moment, I froze in shock. I was used to being the one with the most saturated magic. When it came to color versus color, I always won. I converted a crap ton of neutral magic with Penny, and my little grannies were the ones cleaning up the putrid magic in the park. I'd, I'm talking hijack, hijacked, rotten, nasty magic, and my magic beat that. How could this cobalt slug be worse than that? I felt hot anger roll through me. Color density was my affinity. There was no way this magic could be in my aura, on my home turf, and beat me at my own game. I pulled out to get an overall view of the damage and felt my heart sink. It was bad, really bad. The hostile magic had burrowed, burrowed through my matrix like a mole through loose dirt. Unlike moles, who were actually trying to make tunnels and set up a home, this magic was just trying to wreck my system. The matrix in my chest was in tatters. Most of it had been torn apart, with spheres and capsules floating around in a dense soup of magic. There was some good news. The matrixes in my arms, legs, head, and lower stomach were still together. They just weren't connected to each other, though, so there was no way to coordinate my power. The damn slug had taken out my core. My first thought had been to flood my system with magic and see if that overwhelmed the hostile power. That wasn't going to work now. I needed to stop it in some way while I worked on a solution to get rid of it. Since it was co-opting my magic, it was just going to get bigger and more powerful over time. I couldn't let that happen. I felt the urgency, but my mind was mushy. It was hard to think. Normally, I'd have a lot of ideas, but the physical side of this poison was still messing with me. Gah! I shook my head in frustration. Suggestions, I asked my analytical side. 
Try zooming in and stopping it, he replied. There is, this is still your body and your aura. If that doesn't work, try inviting that magic to switch to your side. You've done it before with neutral magic. Those were some good suggestions. Thank goodness part of me was still functioning well. I flew right up to the front of the cobalt slug, put a mental hand out in front of it, and put a mental hand on the front of it. Stop, I commanded. Now it was so close I could feel its intention, its power. It was strong. No wonder it was converting my magic. I could also feel it hated me, hated who I was, hated what I stood for. This seemed strange, but it felt personal. This was magic that had been crafted just for me. It had a plan, and that plan was to tear me apart any way it could. Again, I felt my anger rising. What did this magic think it was? This was my body. I shouldn't have been attacked like this. This magic shouldn't be happening. I I was an invited guest in a magical house that was founded on love, acceptance, and home. I took that anger and slammed it into the cobalt blue power. It reacted by hardening up. I felt a military vibe, like I was fighting an army of Roman warriors with those giant heavy shields. The enemy magic locked its shields together and shut me out. I was able to make a little dent, but as soon as I quit pushing, it smoothed out. This wasn't quite what I'd planned, but smacking the slug felt good, so I did it a few more times. It helped to vent my anger a bit, and in the process I noticed something. The cobalt magic didn't have more saturation than me. In fact, now I was as close to it, I could see it looked kind of dusty and flat. It cer I certainly had more soul saturation than this thing had. What it had that I was missing was density. I had isolated balls of magic. This thing had one solid mass. My enemy had a steel dagger while I was fighting with a plastic knife. I needed more density, more power. I needed to upgrade my matrix somehow. I had stopped the malicious power from moving forward, but that didn't do me any good because it just reformed and set off in a different direction. Damn. I tried blocking it in, but it was like slime. It just kept oozing through the cracks. I finally wrapped the whole thing in my awareness and clamped down hard. That stopped it. It wiggled and squirmed, but it couldn't break through. I felt victorious until I realized I couldn't hold it and work on a solution at the same time. Maybe I could convert it? I went into salesman mode and tried to coax out some of the magic. Once again, the shields went up. I felt the magic capsule band together. I was the enemy. I must be resisted at all costs. I must be taken down. I was trying to talk nice while it was screaming back hate. This wasn't going to work. I also realized I was talking cordially, but under it all, I was still frustrated and upset. Forget that. I was mad. I w it was raging at me, and I was just raging back. There was no way it was going to be converted like this. Maybe I didn't need it to convert. Maybe I could just throw it out. It couldn't harm me if it was out of my system. That didn't work. The magic was dense and moving it was impossible. I could contain it, but I couldn't budge it. Hmm. Maybe there was another way to neutralize it. It was eating my sapphire blue magic. So what if I took that away and trapped it in layers of emerald green? I couldn't stop it from moving, but I might be able to stop it from eating my magic and growing bigger. It was worth a shot. The shattered remnants of my matrix were all around me, so there were plenty of green capsules to work with. I called them to me and wrapped them around the cobalt slug. Then I waited to see what would happen. So far, so good. The hostile magic was trying to convert my power, but the emerald green was different enough for it to resist the attempt. At least for now. Just to be on the safe side, I called more green capsules and wrapped it in several more layers. It was like slime packaged in bubble wrap, but it was working. Penny, I called. I'm right here, she chimed, and suddenly she was. She was taller than me and built like an Amazon warrior. Her skin was silver and her eyes and hair were copper. She flowed and moved with liquid grace and power. Her hair fluttered in an inv invisible breeze as she gave me a fierce look. Normally she was a naked goddess, but this time she was covered in army armor and carried a spear. My charm was ready for battle. Can you keep this intruder covered in green magic, I asked. I need to work on making my magic denser somehow. 
Of course, she replied. She held out her spear and suddenly green capsules started shooting out of it like it was a magic super soaker. Penny was the only charm I'd made and through a happy accident, she was both aware and awake. I'd been trying to create a magic battery and she'd end up being that and so much more. Having someone who could manipulate and store my magic had ended up being very useful and it had saved me more than once. And that gave me an idea. Why not ask her for help? Her magic was much thicker than the slug. I knew because I converted from neutral magic to my magic. She only had the physical space of a penny, but she could hold magic the size of a large pond. Penny, I said two things real quick. She'd been using her spear to cover the slug in another layer of green capsules, but she stopped and gave me her full attention. First, don't touch the slug yet. It hates me and seems to be able to corrupt my blue magic. I don't want you to become a ca contaminated. Show me, she said. We could share images and memories, and Penny loved to see things from my perspective. She thought being a fleshy creature was fascinating. I shared my thoughts of last night and everything I'd seen and tried s since waking up. Your power in me is stored differently than in you. You're a fleshy creature after all and still quite limited. I don't think the spell can hurt me, although I'm not completely certain. I'll wait for you to do your part and then we can attack together. That sounds great, I replied. Now, second thought. I need to make my magic denser. I know you're a charm and I'm a mage, but do you have any suggestions? She nodded right away. I guess she'd already given us some thought. What you need is an alloy. That way your green and blue mana can enhance each other. In your current state they are next to each other, but each color isn't really supporting the other one. That sounded like a good way to think about it. My head was still feeling spacey though, so the idea wasn't quite there yet. Can you say more about that? I asked. Certainly, let's use gold as an example. I know you humans love the stuff. I find it boring as heck. It's very self-absorbed and not helpful at all. You're lucky you didn't try to make a charm out of gold. You'd have been very disappointed with the results. I hadn't thought about metals having different personalities. That was an interesting discussion for another time. Anyway, Gold on its own is a soft metal. You need to mix it with something else to make it stronger, like zinc or copper. She proudly gestured at her own fine metals. You have two colors to work with. Find out if they are stronger together. She got back to work. She had said her piece and the conversation was over. I had work to do too, but I took a moment just to watch the hostile magic and see how it was doing. It was still moving around and wrecking things, but it seemed more aimless now. If I had to guess, it had just headed towards the highest concentration of magic before. Now it was wrapped in my emerald capsules, it wasn't sure which way to go. Since Penny could spray it with magic, she was keeping well out of its range of influence and seemed to be safe. Satisfied that everything was as good as it was going to get, I flew to a safe spot to begin my testing. The slug had already been through here, so I had lots of spheres and capsules of both colors just floating around. The last time I'd experimented with putting capsules together, I hadn't been at my best. It had been right after getting golem punched and having Isabel kick the crap out of me. I had broken bones and I had been severely deep de sleep deprived. This time I was poisoned and I was still having troubles thinking. Even if I found a solution today and rebuilt my matrix successfully, I wanted to come back at a later time when I was at the top of my game to see if I could do even better. Still, I was doing better than last time and I needed to find a solution right now. I decided to start with what I knew. Capsules were the smallest part of magic that I'd found. I'd zoomed in so much they kind of looked like those fish oil capsules you find in the health section of a store. They were oblong, kind of licking, liquid looking, and I could squeeze them a bit. When I put enough of them together, they sort of popped and condensed into a much bigger sphere. It took 60 capsules to make one sphere for emerald green magic. It took 35 sapphire blue capsules to make one blue sphere. There was actually a lot of capsules. Annabeth only had 15 capsules per sphere and Sandy had 20. Actually, it ended up being 25 once I'd had to start over and include John's magic too. What a night that had been. John had woken up, 
Sandy had saved him from the earth, and he'd saved her from magic deprivation. They'd become oath-bound to each other, and then gotten married and blessed by the Alrun. I really missed John, and I wish he was here. He would have been so fascinated by all the beverages tonight, and I'm sure he would have figured out how to duplicate some of them when we got home. If he was here, Jafar would never have gotten close to me or Sandy. He was always on the lookout for trouble, and John was nobody you wanted to mess with. Wait a minute. Sandy and John's magic. I had already mixed magic before. I'd already made an alloy. The night I had made my matrix, I tried to dump both of my colors together. I dumped green and blue capsules together and nothing had happened. I just figured it didn't work and moved on. The ratio had been about half and half though, half blue and half green. When I'd mixed Sandy and John's together, Sandy had been very low on magic, so I'd used mostly John's magic and just one capsule from Sandy. That had to be it. It was the ratio. I needed mostly one color and only a dab of the other. I felt my excitement rising, pushing back some of my mental fog. I could do this. I called together 60 emerald capsules and one sapphire. Nothing happened, which was a good sign. Normally, the green would just collapse into a, fear, a sphere, so nothing happening meant the blue was having an influence. If I was right, I needed to keep adding green until I got the pop. I added one more green, then another, and another. I climbed up to 68 green capsules, and I was starting to think that this wasn't going to work when I got the pop and all the capsules collapsed into a sphere. I could see all the green surrounding the lone spot of blue in the center. It had worked. I was on the right track, but I needed to do better. This was certainly denser than my current spheres, but the cobalt magic was much more compact than that. Time to see what I could do with two blues. I pushed my first alloy to the side, it would be useful as a reference, and started over with different capsules. This time it took 74 green and 2 blue before it popped into a sphere. I pushed that one to the side as well, kept going. 80 greens matched 3, and 86 greens matched 4 blues. Then it stopped. Anything more than flu 4 blues wouldn't condense, no matter how many greens I matched with it. My brain was still feeling foggy and I couldn't think of anything else to try. I decided to take a quick break and see how Penny and the slug were doing. The hostile magic had worked its way up to my right shoulder and was aimlessly destroying my matrix up there. Penny was keeping it coated in green capsules and it seemed like that was still working out okay. It didn't seem to be getting any bigger and I couldn't see any of the lightning sparks like before. If it started going down my arm, that would be a problem. Until then, I still had time to experiment a bit more. I went back to my safe spot and thought about what to do. Four was the max for natural compression, but could I get it to five by helping it along? I had surrounded the cobalt magic and held it steady. Could I do the same thing here? The green count had gone up to six for each had gone up by six for each blue, so it made sense to try five blue and ninety two green. Nothing popped, of course, but this time I wrapped my awareness around all the capsules and squeezed. It felt just like holding on to the cobalt magic, like I was trying to squish slime. I tried containing and compressing it as hard as I could. Nothing happened, but I could feel it all moving around inside. I tried a different approach. This time I contained and focused on a gentle even pressure all around. I felt something shift again and this time I got the pop. Success! One second. I released the pressure and moved back. Instead of staying as a sphere, it broke down into capsules again. Damn! Not success, but a way forward nonetheless. I'd made a sphere but it hadn't been stable. What had changed? I felt things shift. Did placement matter? I looked at the capsules. Maybe it did. Four blue capsules were in the center, with 92 green ones around it and a lone blue one at the top. Somehow it had broken away from the others and moved to the top. That had to be it. I'd just been pulling the blue and putting the blue in the middle and piling the green around them. What if the center could only hold so much, but there was room for more at the poles? Only one way to find out. 
I added one more blue and six more green, but this time I put one blue at the top and one blue at the bottom. This time I didn't even have to apply pressure. The whole thing popped into a sphere. Woot! I pushed that one at the side with my other successes and noticed something interesting. Even though it had two more blue and 12 more green than the previous four blue success, the resulting sphere was smaller. This was very good news. Not only would, be, would I be able to get more capsules to pop, the result was even denser than before. Time to see if I could do four in the center, two on the poles, on each pole with the corresponding number of green to match. Yes. How about three on the poles, north and south poles, and four in the center? Nope. Could I do three on the poles and add more in the center? No again. I kept on trying different combinations, but I couldn't get a match. Two, four, two was the only combination that seemed to work. I felt like I was missing something, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I took a deep breath and flew back up to check on the slug. It was on the edge of my shoulder, and it looked like it was going to head down my arm. That was okay, I could rebuild it later. Wait, Penny was on my right hand. I did not want this hostile magic to actually get to the base of her power. I still had a few minutes, but time was ticking down. All the work T was doing was starting to make a difference. I was still shaking like ice in a blender, but now I could feel my mental fog lifting a bit. If there was any other possible way of making my magic denser, I needed to figure it out now or go with what I had. I went back to my work area and started on my 242 sphere. I had an idea trying to, I felt an idea trying to break through, but I just couldn't get it. On impulse, I reached up and spun the sphere. It whizzed around its poles, similar to the way the Earth rotated on its axis. Actually, the Earth's axis wasn't straight up and down, it's tilted, and that's what causes the shift from summer to winter. I tilted the sphere slightly, but I overcorrected and the sphere kept tilting, until what used to be the poles were now down around the equator. The background idea finally popped out. A sphere doesn't just have a top and bottom, it also has a left and right and a front and a back. A sphere had six possible axes, not just two. That was it. I was almost shaking with excitement as I made my new sphere. I put four blue in the middle, two blue on the top and bottom, and two, two blue on the top and two blue on the bottom. Then I added two more blue on each of the four points of the equator, north, south, east, and west. I was still not clear, thinking clear enough to do the math, so I just kept on adding green to the sphere and hoped for the best. I added a lot of green. It seemed to go on and on, and the sphere got bigger and bigger. I would just about given up hope when I got the pop. The, small, the new sphere was small. It was about the same size as the green sphere I'd started out with before I'd add all the blue to it. The new sphere, though, held 16 blue and 158 green. That was just crazy. The new configuration packed in almost three times as many capsules in the same space. Surely this would be compact enough to stop the slug. There was only one way to find out. So I converted the rest of my test spheres to the new format and took them with me as I flew up to check on Penny. The hostile magic had made its way to the upper part of my right arm and was continuing to wreak havoc. I needed to get my new matrix going quickly. Fortunately, I knew just the place to start. Penny, I have a new alloy, I told her excitedly. Then I shared my memories with her on how I'd put it together. Excellent, she said. Hugs now or after the battle? She knew I liked hugs, although she really didn't understand why. She just passed it off as a human, as a thing that humans like. It seemed like she enjoyed battle, though. I got a real bloodthirsty vibe coming from her. She wanted to hurt the cobalt magic. She wanted to hurt it bad. Hugs afterwards, I told her. Right now, I'm, getting, I'm going to need a lot of your spare magic to power the new Matrix. Can you take care of the slug and still give me power at the same time? Of course, she said confidently. Start it by my ring. I'll give you all the magic you need. I picked up my new spheres and flew down to where Penny was wrapped around my forefinger. Penny could be any shape she needed. She'd even been a mask for my face for a while when I'd been repairing my skull and jaw, but this was her favorite spot. She seemed to like a simple plain band and she didn't radiate any power, so people didn't know she was so much more. 
I picked a slot to start with and started breaking down my matrix into the individual capsules. Then I started combining everything into the new spheres. Once I had several, I started placing them in the form of a basic square matrix. As I worked, I noticed another advantage of the new alloy spheres. They could exist much closer together than the old spheres made up of just one color of magic. I put together a quick 10 by 10 by 10 alloy matrix and compared it to the blue and green matrix around it. It looked like not only were the new alloy, sphere three, alloy spheres three times denser, but I could fit seven times as many spheres in the same space. That meant this new matrix was going to be 21 times denser than before. I was going to get a huge upgrade on my magic. Like huge! A denser matrix meant I could channel more magic into my creations and do it faster. It meant I could be more magic resistant from attacks. It meant I could convert my physical cells to awaken cells at a faster rate. This was good stuff. Hopefully it was enough to take care of my slug fest or my slug problem. Time to find out. The last time I'd made my matrix, I'd done it by hand. I'd crafted every sphere and placed them carefully into their assigned spots. That worked, but it was tedious and slow as hell. Fortunately, Annabeth had shown me a better way, and I'd already tried it on Sandy. This was going to be a lot of fun. I started by getting a new sense for my alloy matrix. First, I listened to it. This is where Annabeth's talent was way ahead of mine. She could listen to a baby matrix, get it, and then sing the rest into existence. I wasn't that good, so I had to try and utilize all my senses. I couldn't hear my old matrix. Whatever sound it made was too small for me to hear. But my new one, that had a tone. It kind of sounded like someone was playing a low note on a cello. It was pleasant, soothing, and made a nice background. It wasn't hurried, but it wasn't sleepy either. It was the kind of sound they use in the movies when the hero is looking out on the city at night. The lights are twinkling and the world is full of quiet possibilities. It's the note of contemplation, acceptance, and peace. Maybe the character goes in and snuggles in bed, feeling good about his day. Or maybe the character gets dressed and heads out into the night, ready for some adventure. The more I listened, the more I liked this note. It was me. I tasted them. This hadn't worked last time, but this time they sort of tasted like boiled potatoes. That seemed strange, but I wasn't here to judge. I felt them. They weren't really squishy anymore. They felt like hard rubber. For some reason, the matrix itself reminded me of travel, like a tire rolling down a road. I smelled them. Again, they reminded me of rubber. Sight was easy. The matrix looked, the matrix looked dense, powerful, and stable. I was ready. Holding the sound, taste, feel, sight, and smell of the alloy matrix in my mind, I gently pushed it out to my surroundings. Thank you for all you have been, I said to my old matrix. Now become something more. I've always had a great relationship with my magic. I've treated it with respect and wonder and it always done what I've asked of it and more. This time was no exception. The near spheres exploded into their component capsules which then reformed into the alloy spheres and these new spheres gracefully floated into place in the new matrix. The process continued, expanding out for me in a wave of transformation. The whole thing was just amazing. It was like watching a real-life sci-fi movie. I felt like I was Magneto, reforming the world around me with my power. It wasn't long before the capsules in my old matrix were all used up, and I hadn't even filled up my forefinger with the new alloy yet. Time for Penny to kick in and make up the difference. She was going to have to kick in a lot. Penny, I called. I'm ready. I felt her acknowledgement and the magic started pouring out of her ring. The alloy matrix sucked it in like a hungry squirrel chewing down on nuts. Peanuts. I filled my forefinger, then my palm, then the rest of my fingers. The alloy matrix built up to my elbow and then started on my up upper arm where the hostile matrix was crawling around or the hostile magic was crawling around. This was the real test. Would it stop the cobalt slug or would the enemy keep smashing me apart? The alloy matrix continued to grow, reached the cobalt slug, encased it, and kept on going. 
I flew over to Penny's side so we could watch what happened together. The slug paused. I'm sure it was sensing a change in its surroundings. Then it started attacking again. This time, though, it couldn't go anywhere. It smashed into the new matrix harder and harder, but the spheres f held. They didn't shatter, and they didn't fall out of line. They weren't completely firm, either. They had a bit of gig to them, and that really helped to blunt the, cult, the slug's power. It was like it was trying to break through a wall, but the wall was covered in soft pillows. The Matrix gave a bit, then when the slug ran out of power, the Matrix pushed it back. We both continued to watch it a bit more. Stage 1, containment, was a success. I needed to keep going with the new Matrix, then come back and figure out stage 2, getting rid of this thing. I realized I was smelling smoke. Like, in real life, out in the house there was smoke. I decided to just let it go. Balaji was here. If I was in danger, he could always pick me up and take me somewhere else. I also realized I was feeling better. My thoughts didn't feel as smothered anymore. I still wasn't out of the woods yet, but I, I was getting there. I asked Penny to keep an eye on the slug while I kept building out the grid. My chest area was a total wreck, but that ended up being helpful. It meant there was a lot of floating magic pieces to work with, and the alloy growth came easily. It took several minutes, but I directed the growth all over the rest of my body. It wasn't a perfect job. I would need a second pass, but at least all my magic was back to being connected again. Now, time to deal with my pest problem. I flew back to Penny and the slug. It hadn't gone anywhere. Good. Penny was still standing with her spear, waiting. Given how tall she was and how powerful she felt, I realized she reminded me of Athena, the goddess of war. I was glad she was on my side. Are you ready? she asked. I nodded. Do your thing, I told her. Just don't get contaminated. If you feel any danger at all, back off. I can't afford to lose you. I had no idea what she was going to do, but she was ready. She gave me a bloodthirsty smile and raised her spear. Once again, she shot out green capsules, except this time they shot out like a real gun. They hit like a real gun, too, tearing through the skin of the slug and deep into its body. I'd pounded on the slug and had barely made a dent. In one move, Penny had almost torn it in half. Damn! The slug was basically a big mass of hostile magic, or that's what I'd thought up to this point. Seeing it laid open like that, I could see that not all the magic was the same. The skin of the slug was thick and full of cobalt's color. The center was different. The center was soft, juicy, and I could see the individual capsules of magic inside. They weren't infused with cobalt. They were co coated with it. That was a big difference. Oh, hi. Penny attacked it again and again. The slug squirmed and writhed, but it couldn't defend itself, and it couldn't go anywhere. Penny's attacks were successful in a way, but the hostile magic was still there. I needed a way to get rid of it, and I had an idea. Penny, see if you can break off a piece of it, I said. Let's start with something smaller for now. She nodded and used her green capsule railgun slash spear to slice off a piece near the back. It started to reaffix, but I flexed the matrix and quickly pushed it between the two parts. Then I flexed the matrix again and whisked the piece away so it was well clear of the main slug. I zoomed in for a closer look and I could feel the difference right away. This time I wasn't hit with a wall of hate. Instead, it gave off a wisp of disdain, a whiff of disdain, which I could easily handle. I wanted to convert it, but first I needed to get myself in order. I'd been upset, frustrated, and hungover the last time I tried. Of course my invitation hadn't worked. T was taking care of my hangover. Now I just need to take care of my attitude. One of the greatest things I discovered when I was healing the first time was how to deal with adversity. Tyler had talked to me first, and he said that anything, no matter how bad, can become a new normal. When something is normal, you can work on it. You can come up with new ideas, new solutions. You can plan for an outcome, work towards it, and hopefully get yourself out of whatever trouble you're in. Annabeth had talked to me later, and her advice boiled down to one simple phrase. Whatever you resist, 
persists. If you fight something, resist it, and give it all your energy, it will stick around. On the other hand, if you just accept what is happening, like really accept it, then you can start from a new beginning. I'd taken their talks to heart and I'd used their advice more than once to get out of a jam, and I was going to use their ideas again. It all began with acceptance and that is what I did. I accepted that the house wasn't as safe as I hoped it would be. I accepted my evening had been awesome and then not so awesome. I accepted that this piece of magic hated me. I was okay. Life is struggle. Life is work. Life has setbacks. The greatest thing was I was still alive. I was a mage. I had magic, new friends, and a new home. Sure, I had to fight for it, but that was okay. I'd probably fight for it a lot, but it was better than the alternative. If I were dead, there would be no love, no laughter, no magic weddings, no penny, no Bermuda. I chose life. I chose acceptance. I felt my soul settle and strengthen as I reached out and touched the piece of hostile magic. This time I wasn't met with a shield wall. Instead, I felt a variety of responses ranging from indifference to animosity. I could work with that. I started with indifference first. I thought about the good times at the house, dinners with Sandy and the crew, drinking with John, joking with Annabeth. I touched it gently and offered it the opportunity to be part of that. Be part of me. Be part of the good times. Over half of the piece converted right away. I was so surprised. This was hostile magic after all. I didn't expect to win so much of it without more of a fight. Only a few minutes ago, it had been part of a larger piece trying to tear me apart. I kept the invitation going and more and more of the hostile magic broke away and came to my side. Finally, I was left with less than a quarter of the original magic. I stopped the invitation and took a read on what was left. The remaining magic was infused with, col with cobalt color, not just color. Blech. The remaining magic was infused with cobalt color, not just coated, and it had a different feel. It seemed more militaristic, like it was part of a unit. They supported each other and they were trained to fight. Most of it felt like it wasn't directly trying to fight me, so again, I could work with that. This time I thought about fighting Big Ugly, about how my physical body, my magic matrix, and Penny had all come together. Oops. all come together to deliver a blow that had stopped a huge train of a man. A man that had stolen and corrupted the magic of others. My magic was loyal. It was there. F I was there for my magic and my magic was there for me. We belonged together and they could be a part of that. I extended that invitation, and this time almost all of the cobalt capsules converted. All that was left was a tiny cluster of five capsules, but those capsules hated me. I was finally facing some of the core magic that had kept this whole slug together. I zoomed in for a closer look. The first thing I noticed was the hostile magic had coated these capsules in a thick slime. As the capsules of magic had left, the hostile magic had distilled down and now it was mostly just thick mucus. I felt hatred coming from it, but it was weak. It kind of reminded me of something I'd seen before, but I couldn't think what it was. On impulse, I reached out, grabbed a big glob of the nasty stuff and pulled it away. As soon as it lost contact with the capsules, it started changing. It lost its liquidity. It turned into a dry, powdery-looking substance and then faded away like dust in the wind. Now I knew what it reminded me of. It was like Thing One. When I had taken back my power in the throne room, he'd been full of life, power, and anger, but as soon as I took my magic back, he turned into a dry, weak mess. That's what was happening here. This cobalt stuff was some sort of spell or bad soul, and it was powerless without magic to give it life. Now that I knew what to do, I tore into the rest of the goop and ripped it free. Once enough of the nasty coating was gone, the five capsules joined me with no problems. I was just a mental perspective inside my aura, but I still did a happy dance. I now knew how to beat this sucker. 
I zoomed back to the main slug and this time Penny caught off an even bigger chunk off its backside. I whisked it away to a safe distance and was just getting ready to start working on it when I felt the bed shift. The burnt smell was much stronger now. Then I felt someone take my hand and I knew right away it was Sandy. After the golem had hit me, I'd spent many days with a smashed up face, so I hadn't been able to see or talk. Sandy had sat with me and held my hand for hours on end. She did it just to let me know she was there. We'd communicated by her asking questions and I squeezed once for yes and twice for no. Jason, can you hear me? She asked. Squeeze, yes. Are you working on the effects of the drink? Squeeze. Yes. Sandy was good at this game. There's an art to asking yes or no questions so there isn't any ambiguity. Is there anything I can do to help you? Squeeze, squeeze, no. Is there anything else? Is there anything anyone else can do to help? Squeeze, squeeze, no. Do you want me to leave you alone for now? Squeeze, yes. I'd figured it out. I just needed a bit more time to work the solution. My thoughts were feeling so much clearer, so T was working his magic. I realized I was lying in bed shaking, so it probably looked like I was dying. Or at least there's something horribly wrong with me and I needed help right away. I was getting it under control, though. It wasn't as bad as it looked. I, But I wasn't ready to come out of my detailed view and explain it to everyone. They were just going to have to wait. I picked up other voices in the room. It sounded like there were several people here. Sandy gave my hand a comforting squeeze back as I pushed all that out of my awareness and got back to the business at hand. Now I knew what to do. The process went much faster. I didn't wait for the final few cells to start pulling the goop off. And as a result, the invitation process went much quicker. It almost felt like the magic capsules were being held hostage by the cobalt slime as I took as they took every opportunity to switch to me as fast as they could. I finished up with that last chunk of slug and went back for more. We did two more chunks, each bigger than the last, until I felt confident enough to take on what was left. Despite the danger it represented, the ending seemed to happen quickly. One minute I was inviting cells and ripping off slime and then it was done. I stepped back with Penny and looked at where it used to be with satisfaction. The danger was over, but the new matrix wasn't totally settled in yet. Usually there was a feeling of elasticity and wholeness when the matrix settled in. That still wasn't present yet. I started from ahead and worked my way down. There were surprising little problems considering this had been a rush job. I fixed a few things here and there and really only had one big alignment issue in my right leg. Once that was fixed, I felt a wave of pure power flow through me. It felt structured, organized, and very powerful. It was like my magic booted up and now it was ready to go. It also felt so nice. I was whole again. I took. It was time to check on the physical side, so I zoomed over to where T was working near my spine. How's it looking? I asked. It's good. He said, looking around in satisfaction, we've gotten rid of al all the alcohol as well as the hallucinogen in the drink. You're going to feel a bit sore from all the shaking, but a bit of sleep will fix that right up. Thank you, I said sincerely. I don't know what I'd do without you. I don't know what you'd do without me either, he chuckled. Now, go on with you. we got a room full of people waiting to make sure you're okay. He gave me a happy bow and then surfed away. I should have noticed it earlier, but I wasn't shaking anymore. If I'd have been on my own, I would have just snuggled in with Bermuda and gone to sleep, but that wasn't an option at the moment. So I zoomed back out to normal mode and opened my eyes. The first thing I saw was Sandy's anxious face. She looked worn out, but happy to see me. I scooched up in bed and gave her a happy hug. Oh, Jason, she said, I'm so happy to see you are okay. I'm good, I told her. She didn't let go, so I went into turbo hug mode. Seriously, I'm good. I could hear other people in the room. I'll give you the full story later. Question is, though, are you good? It sucked for a while there, she said softly, but I was able to tap into some earth magic and fix it. She was still hugging me, so she tapped me with her wedding ring. Oh, 
John or the Alrun had been able to step to help out somehow. She smelled like smoke, so something had gone down. It sounded like she had a good story to tell. I also realized I was naked under the covers, so that kind of limited my movement. Oh, that's right. Balaji had taken off my clothes after they got gotten splattered with puke. Speaking of Balaji, I gave him a hug next after Sandy let me go. Fortunately, he had clothes on now, so it wasn't that awkward. Thank you for taking care of me, I said sincerely. It was no problem, he said kindly. Are you sure you're okay? I assured him I was, and then I got that question again in a variety of ways by everybody else in the room. It seemed like there were a lot of people here. Amaya was here, of course, as she'd been the one to carry Sandy back to our rooms. Pixie Girl was here, and she mentioned something about setting Sandy's room back in order. Aida, Aida from the gazebo was here, along with some people I didn't recognize. It turns out there were more people from a house Hyderabad, as well as Pixie Girl's superiors. I just felt like a blur. It was late, I was tired, and I just wanted to sleep. Amaya took over that point and got everybody moving. Since Sandy's room was fixed, and she seemed to be back in good health, she was good to sleep in there. Everyone else was very concerned about leaving me on my own, but I assured them I was fine now. In the end, Balaji decided to sleep in the greeting room so he'd be available in case things turned bad again. He was also going to check on both of us every hour to make sure we were alive and doing okay. I was very grateful. I knew I was fine, but I felt better knowing he was going to be checking on Sandy. Sandy gave me a look before she left to let me know she felt the same thing about him checking on me. Balaji and Maya were turning out to be true friends, the kind that stood behind you when you're in trouble. Pixie Girl let me know her boss had given her more Morphous points to take care of us and she was supposed to check on us throughout the gathering. I got a kiss on the cheek from her and my first hug from Aida. She, it was a gentle and stately hug, but still filled with warmth and concern. She said Pixie Girl would check on us when we were in the room, and she was going to check on us at the events. If I needed anything, anything at all, just let her know. Finally, everyone left, and I settled back in, down into bed again. Bermuda called up on my chest and licked my face, purring all the while. I stroked his silky fur and thought about just how lucky I was. I had the love and affection of a beautiful young kitty. I had the support and help of lots of people here at the gathering. And Sandy was supporting me just as much as I was supporting her. My body was sore but healthy and my magic matrix was not only fixed, but much better. Tomorrow was a new day. The gathering was back on track. I was okay. Life was good. Eventually, Bermuda settled down to his usual spot on my pillow. I rolled over, and before I knew it, I was asleep. And so ends the chapter. So at this point, you're welcome to log off, or we have a very quick show and tell. Harold, you want to hand me the capsule? My honey is hopping too. Okay, so here we go. So I don't know if you can see this or not. So here is the fish capsule. Yay! I just happen to have one. Where in the heck is that camera at? Anyway, there it is. So that's kind of what we're thinking about when they have all of those capsules and they all come together and they all go poof and then turn into a big sphere like so. So this is from what? Pottery Barn? I think. Pier one, probably pier one. Anyway, kind of looks like this. So when we were talking about the sphere, so in the middle would be the four alternate colored uh, capsules. You want to hand me, you're supposed to be over here. Handing me my, my stuffs. All right, so then the next thing is, and I don't really have anything good, so we're going to use a little thing and hopefully that will show up on the camera. Yeah, it does kind of. Okay, hand me another one. Alright, so he gets four in the middle, and then he gets, boy, that's not looking very good in the light, but anyway, then he's getting two on top and two on bottom, so he's got two, four, two. Then he spins it, whoosh, so imagine it's spinning, and then it's on the axis like the earth, and then it keeps going too far, and all of a sudden he realizes, oh, wait a minute, 
I have a new north and south. And if you rotate it, dun, 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 I have all six axes. All right. So at the end, his sphere has two, 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 two in the front, two in the back, four in the middle, and enough green to make it all condense. And at the end of the day, the condensed sphere is slightly smaller than what he actually started out with. And what I was originally envisioning is you had the spheres like this and they repelled each other which I guess I don't have another sphere here, but anyway. So the new ones, but they're denser, they can actually exist closer together, which makes the overall matrix 27 times, I think I said 27 times, more uh, dense than his old matrix. So he's got a, a 27X upgrade in power. So just want to bring that through. Anyway, all's done. Good luck. Um, I will hopefully see you again next week for the next chapter. Thank you.